is one of our last sessions. We have one more session planned next week. That'll be an open forum for people to ask any questions specific to their farm or gardening projects. We'll be able to um, conversate a little bit more, make sure that everybody's aware of resources that are available to them and, and get, to a little, get to know a little bit more about you and your needs um, as a farmer and gardener in, in the Mahoning Valley. So really excited about that. But um, tonight's presentation, I'll let Lee introduce our speaker, but I know if, if you're just joining us for the first time tonight, my name is Cassandra Clevenger and I'm the Community Resource Coordinator at Trumbull Neighborhood Partnership. I do a lot of work in food systems and, and helping to connect people to various resources. And that's a big piece of what this project is about and working with Lee. But I think most people, I, I recognize most of these names, so I don't know if we have any new folks tonight. But um, without further ado, I'll go ahead and pass it off to Lee for him to introduce himself. All right, thanks, Cassandra. So um, my name is Lee Beers. I'm an extension educator for OSU Extension in Trumbull County. Um, and tonight, if you were joining us for the pesticide presentation a couple of weeks ago, you already know Eric Draper. But for those of you who are new, Eric is probably going to be more in his element tonight, talking about tree fruits and grapes. Um, Eric does a fantastic pruning class up at Sage's Orchards um, in non-COVID time, so hopefully he'll be back next year. Um, Eric is my go-to person. If there's something I don't know about apples or pears or peaches, say, Eric, what's this? <laughs> and he <laughs> will answer it for me. So I'm excited to have Eric uh, with us. He's Extension Educator in Geauga County. Um, yeah, and with that, I'll let Eric take it from here. All right. You didn't say anything about your pruning clinic, Rook. Yes, we are going to be having a pruning clinic at Hartford Orchards on the first Saturday in March. Um, but we are just going to be focusing on apples. Um, Eric's pruning class, if you want to learn to prune any fruit short of brambles and strawberries, his <laughs> clinic is the, is the one to go to. All right, cool. All right. Well, it's good to be here. You see my screen? Everything's okay? Thumbs up? Yep, we can see All everything right. fine. Awesome. I just have to say, this is pesticides and are, are perfectly fine with me in the context of I understand them, but I've been around tree fruits all my life. So this is going to be hard to try and condense and drop things that I don't need to talk about. So I want you, Lee, at, um, at uh, 720-ish to give me, if I haven't hit the end, I want to move into grapes at that point, okay? All right. I'm setting an alarm now for 720. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. All right. So tree fruits and grapes. It is without doubt probably one of the, um, I, I'm trying not to make it complicated or simplistic. Do you see this? <laughs> I didn't, <laughs> I didn't know that there was anything else, but I, it's, it, I'm trying to make this to where you can grasp the concept, understand. I'll try to clarify a few things. I'm sure many more questions will arise. That's my usually go-to. No crying over past mistakes. We'll just move forward, understand where you went wrong. We'll move forward with that. If we all leave with at least one new idea, I've done my job. So if, if anybody recognizes this fruit, then you are a tropical individual. It's Latin binomios, Theobroma cacao, also known as the food of the gods, because it is chocolate. Now, this should be exciting for you. Chocolate is a fruit. And understanding, if you understand anything about the five servings of fruit per day, this puts a new twist on things for you. <laughs> so keep that in mind. A few resources. This is probably one of the best bulletins we have for homeowners. Um, it's a great. It's a great bulletin. I don't know how, except sometimes we can get it, other times we can't, but it is a, an absolutely fabulous and it is intended for backyard fruit growers. Here's another resource I have for you. 
This is from the Midwest Home Fruit Production Guide. So it kind of gives you an overview about the fruits. It's free online. The um, probably the one that I'm most excited about. This is a great opportunity because this is written again with a home or a backyard fruit producer in mind from Purdue. Purdue does a great job with this. It is a PDF online, and, and I know that can be a downer for many people, but it's a great resource to go and look and see what you'll need to do. It's free. It's there. It's free. I, I don't know how you can go any get any better than that. It's, it's free, and it is a great resource, and it walks you through the stages of where you need to pay attention to applying control products to control certain things. All right. Another resource, there's an OSU Fruit Pathology Lab. They have a home disease management series. That's pretty cool. Unfortunately, there's only two in there. They're backyard fruit diseases. Uh, and, and here's the OSU. I'll give all these to, to Lee and let you, you guys post them, find out, sort through them. Then you have them, so don't worry too much about trying to write, or, or if you really want, you can take pictures of the screen, but whatever, however works for you. But here's the pathology lab. But again, this is home grape and home apple. The, unfortunately, that's all. I'll see if I can stir up a hornet's nest down there and see if they'll do more fruit because it is getting more and more uh, a draw and interest. People are wanting to grow their own fruits and, and enjoy them. Because there is nothing, I got to tell you, as a grad student, um, I helped care for a 30-acre fruit farm. And I got to tell you, there is nothing like when you're mowing out there mowing the grass and you just reach over and grab a peach <laughs> and then just stick it in your mouth and just suck on it. And when it's dead ripe, peach will just suck right down. And then you just throw away the seed and the skin onto the next one. It was beautiful. So, but there's nothing like the flavor of, of having your own fruit. So the next thing people typically want to know, hey, where can I buy these? All right. For small fruits, I'll throw that up there simply because we're talking also a little bit about fruit, about grapes, which is considered a small fruit. So Norse Farms, Indiana Berry, Gurney's, I really love Norse Farms. They are the go-to for most of the commercial growers. Therefore, they also have great resources in the context of fact sheets that you can just go in, read about, and find out really how to raise or what you need to do in order to prepare to put those plants, that crop in. Blueberries, in case, yeah, you know, I, I can't get away from this. And, and if you didn't know, uh, this is uh, blueberries are what Lee did his doctorate work on. So he, we, my dad was a plant geneticist for USDA and bred blueberries. And, and so for me, blueberries hold a, pl a special place in my heart. But Bielsteins, they grow their own. They're in Mansfield. They grow their own plants. They kind of sorted through all the details out there to get you uh, what they have found works for them here in Ohio. But we also have the Grand Champs, which is an, an, an incredible grower. And I, I have to say this, even though I'm wearing Ohio State, when I have to say, M -m 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 it, <laughs> it helps <laughs> just a little bit. Michigan, it is, they are an, an incredible, incredible a grower, producer, and just a wonderful resource to buy excellent quality product. All right, tree fruits. The first one up here, ACN, is actually Adams County Nursery. Adams County Nursery is in Adams County, PA. They do a fabulous job. Very, um, I, I guess you could even say somewhat almost a little localized kind of approach. Just a wonderful job of producing fruit trees. Stark Brothers is another one. Van Well is the other. Those are probably my top three. Gurneys and Burpees. I even found this grandpa's orchard. 
it was kind of fun. But um, the AC Adams County Nursery Stark Brothers Van Well, you cannot go wrong with them. They the same trees. The when we talk about rootstocks and everything else, it will make more sense. But they are on top of it, and they produce for many of the growers also. So we have to talk about the hierarchical scale of plant resource allocation. Now I know half of you just fell off your chairs. It's important to understand this because it takes an incredible amount of energy, photosynthates, resources from a plant to produce fruit. You've got to remember that. And in order to understand that more, there's this, what I call the hierarchical scale. The first part of this hierarchy is, first thing, survive. All plants, life processes, if they consume all the photosynthates produced in that plant, that plant will literally just survive, okay? If it doesn't have everything it needs, if it doesn't get enough sunshine, it's gonna stay at that first level. The second level, if it's got excess resources, then it can move into the next level, the secondary level, which is new twig growth. And this makes perfect sense horticulturally. The new twig growth, what are you doing? What are you sticking on twigs? Leaves. What do leaves do? Intercept light, create carbohydrates. You're creating more resources. So the second level above survive, the first going one level above surviving, just barely surviving, is new twig extension, growing. The plant is growing. The third level, the tertiary level, flower initiation and production. So if somebody says, you know what, Eric, and I get these questions all the time, you know, I, I, my, my plant's just not flowering. Well, okay. Then if you're looking at this, you say, well, you're not getting flowers at all, or they're freezing, or no, I'm not getting flowers. Well, in my mind, I'm sitting there thinking, huh, you may not have give that plant what it needs because it doesn't have resources. Yes, it might be growing, but it doesn't have enough resources. So it's stuck in that secondary level. So keep this in mind because fruit production takes a whole lot of resources. Consider this. It takes about 40 leaves, whether it's apple or peaches, to ripen one fruit. 40 leaves, functional, all season long. That's pretty amazing, okay? So it takes an awful lot. You cannot have too much sunshine when we're talking about tree fruits, okay? So when somebody starts talking to you, say, oh, you know, I, my, I, get, I get a couple of flowers. Again, I'm sitting there thinking, well, then tell me what's going on there because it's not getting, the plant is not getting what it needs to produce fruit because it wants to flower. It wants to produce fruit. That's what it's all about. All right. So we also need to understand bearing wood. First year wood, that means any mature wood or growth of the twig, cane, branch extension, whatever, produce the previous season. This becomes important because the wood that grew last year will bear fruit this year. This is critical for especially nectarines, peaches, and grapes. They bear on first year wood. So if you have a plant that bears on first year wood, you need to cut the bejeebers out of it prune it hard because you want it to produce new wood because buds, flowering buds come on new wood. So it's totally different. The other is what we call the second year wood. Most of our tree fruits, with the exception of peaches and nectarines, bear on second year wood, meaning people say, well, I I'm not getting any fruit or flowers. And I said, how often do you prune the tree? Oh, every year. Oh, boy, red flag, red flag. 
Because if a plant bears on second year wood, the first year you get growth, a, a shoot growing. The second year, that same shoot expands and pushes out laterals, which we call fruiting spurs. And flowers are created for the following year. So it literally takes three years. So every time you make a cut on a typical tree fruit, you have to tell yourself, I don't want fruit for three years because that's literally what you're doing. So second year wood versus first year wood. First year wood, you cut them hard. If you're talking peaches, typically when you're out there pruning peaches, you're taking out a third to a half of the wood every year because you want new wood coming because you want new buds. Same with, with grapes. Most people don't prune grapes properly. You take out 90% of the old wood. That's, that's perfect. Most people say, you've killed my vine. Nope, I've done it right. Second year wood, you want to leave it alone. Leave it alone. Let it produce those laterals. Let it produce those fruiting spurs, which then produce flowers so that the next season it can produce fruit. All right. So grapefruit, we, we started to talk a little bit. Grapefruit needs maximum sunshine, water, no competition. We just kind of bred that out of them. I, I mean, even for example, you, you have a tree in, if you put one tree in the lawn with turf and one tree over in a spot in near the garden and you, you kill all the weeds out, guess which one will do better? The one where it's not competing with turf because turf is so much more efficient at getting water and nutrients out of the soil than is the tree. So they don't really like competition. We don't like late frost. I know everybody's gonna cry. <laughs> oh, geez. I must have answered 25, 30 questions today about this. We'll talk about it so you are armed. No late frost, well-drained soils. It is critical in our, with our spring, well-drained soils are important. And if you say, well, my, you know, I'm in, yes, Lee is over there laughing. Well, we're in Trumbull County. I'd like asphalt over here. Well, you can still raise it up. Raising that bed up three to four inches changes the world. Just raise that area up so that the roots will stay, will keep oxygenated while, the, while that water drains out in the spring. Our problem is in the spring, we just have too much water. And if you plant down in the soil, it's just one big stopping mess. All right, so correct pH. You gotta understand pHs. The more you find that sweet spot, the more nutrients are available. Remember what I said, to produce fruit, that takes a tremendous amount of energy, resources for that plant. Nutrition, paying attention to the nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, calcium, all become extremely important. Small fruit and tree fruit. I, I threw small fruit in there because I just wanted to throw it in there just to show you the contrast. Small fruits tend to be, so we're thinking, we're seeing grapes, blueberries, space-friendly, laissez-faire culture, easier to take care of, small yet tasty. Cross-pollination helps, but not necessarily. Pollinators are nice, and some training is required. Now, with tree fruits, you've got to understand space restrictions. You don't want to crowd them. You want to give them the maximum because they need 40 leaves per fruit for an entire season. Space restrictions, it's a very demanding culture also. Potentially large yields. If you have larger trees, and in the orchards, we're kind of moving away from large trees, but you have very potentially large yields. Cross-pollination for most tree fruit is an absolute must. Gotta have. You've got to have a different cultivar, and it has to cross-pollinate. And this even becomes even a little trickier, because if you think about it, those pollinators become really important. What's good bee weather? <laughs> you people, huh? Well, 
the bees have to fly and work the flowers. Guess what? If it's a day like today, how often are bees out there? They're not out there. If they, they don't like flying. If it's below 50, they'll just stay at the hive. They like it 55 to 75. Above 70 to 80, they want to stay and cool the hive. Light breeze, sunny, some water, they're content. But if they have to work too hard, you're going to, something has to give. And that giving is pollinators are critical. And training, which we can say pruning, pruning becomes really critical for tree fruit. All right. How do you know when it's been a good fruit year? Well, it's easy to tell. You don't know what to do with it all. That's, <laughs> or how about a new twist on an old fruit? I thought that was pretty clever of somebody. Curve yellow. Well, yeah, selling it, finding new ways to, to market. All right. So what causes trees to bloom? You probably never even thought about that. Why do trees bloom? Well, do what they do. Well, not really. Well, is it the Chiquita banana lady? No, it's not the Chiquita banana lady. It comes down, all plants have dormancies. And here's another fascinating thing. This is, this is something Lee did his uh, graduate work on. Pretty fascinating what he found out. So free, for tree fruits, he worked on blueberries, but tree fruit dormancy, it comes down to what we call chill units. Every plant has, has a, when it goes into dormancy, until it works through this chill unit, accumulation, it won't come out, especially if it's a tree fruit. It has to accumulate a certain number of chill hours in order for that substance to be abated in that plant to allow it to bloom. So a chill unit is one hour at three to nine centigrade or 37 to 48. So it's one hour, for example, Red Delicious apples need 1,432 chill units. That's a lot of chill units. But that also helps ensure that they don't come on too early. This whole chill unit accumulation is pretty cool. And if you really want to go deep, you can talk to Lee about it. Temperatures above 60 degrees, you get a negative. You start losing chill units. Temperatures lower, you accumulate much slower. And anything below zero, 32 degrees, there's no contribution. So it has a very regimented approach to making sure that it will chill down, the tree sits there, and once it accumulates enough, of it gets enough chill units, it releases. It's ready to roll, just like has happened here in the past. How many of you have ever could have imagined that full bloom of peaches on the 20th of April? Uh, that's, that's almost unheard of. Each one of these is a stage. These are all important stages because all of the fruit trees have these stages where silver tip, green tip, there's certain things that you do at each one of these stages. Pink, king bloom, full bloom, half inch green, all of this, when you're talking about, people talk about, well, at green tip, you want to put on at least a, a, a dormant oil spray. So this also correlates with what's going on trying to care for these plants. All right, everybody's in a panic. What will happen tonight with cold temperatures? Well, here's the only thing I can tell you. Note on here, here's apple. Note that it says old temperature. Old standard temperature is the lowest temperature endured for, endured for 30 minutes without damage. That's the lowest it can go for 30 minutes without any damage. All right? So for apples, depending on the stage you're in, whether it's sil silver, green tip, half inch green, wherever you are, first pink. Notice if your apple's at first pink, where the, that bud is opened up and you can see pink beginning to show, 10% kill, kill 
of the buds will occur at 28 degrees. 90% will occur at 24 degrees. So we are really hoping, <laughs> we're really hoping that, that they don't, the temperatures do not drop out. Depending where you are developmentally on that tree, whether it's apples, pears, apricots, peaches, peaches are full bloom. Um, look, 10% kill at 27 degrees, 90% kill 24 degrees. Oh, that's, uh, I'm, I'm just hoping that there's a good thin. I, I'm okay with a good thin, but um, losing most of the bloom, not a good approach if you're an orchardist. But that's part of farming, right? Sweet cherries, again, based on when, how far along, and which, which stage of bloom you're at will determine what happens. What about grapes? That's our other. What about grapes? Well, again, looking at where you are in the developmental growth of that plant will ultimately, ultimately determine what will happen. Depending on if your grapes are at bud burst or at here at first leaf, you can see if you're at first leaf, you get a 90% kill with 21 degrees. I'm really hoping they were talking 31 ish. Uh, we'll see what happens. But people say, well, what can I do? Well, orchards, at least um, vineyards, will actually have air machines and turn on those big fans, those big air machines, and pump, mix that air. Because remember, warm air rises, cold air sinks. So the cold air sinks, and that's why most of our excellent grape or vineyards are planted out near the out near the lake because the cold air will sink out over the lake and as that cold air sinks out warm air moves up and you get that constant mixing that's what the fans are all about that's what the that mixing trying to find that slope why most of most of the vineyards are on slopes that's what that's all about what you need to do then is after I think we're going to have two cold nights. What you need to do is check the flowers. So you go out, and this is this is a cherry flower, but you can still see these these are staminate flower. The stamens that has the pollen in them. This is the pistil. This is the female portion. This is the ovary that turns into the fruit right here. This is the important item here. Because if you look at this one, you say, oh, great, no damage. That's awesome because I don't see any damage on the petals. But notice the petals here were damaged. But do you see it here? Look at the pistol. The pistol's brown. So no matter what happens, that is not going to bear fruit. So you have to go out and check the flowers of your fruit trees to see what's going on. With apples, same thing. You look at those flowers, where are they? You kind of pull them apart. You say, oh my, well, we're still good because the whole flower didn't get zapped. Well, no, what you have to do is go down into the center, cut into the center and look. Because again, these are all stamens but the pistol, the female portion that turns into that, ov that ovary that turns into the apple has been killed. I've seen this happen a lot. Sometimes you'll see petals that aren't affected and everybody's like, ah, oh, good. But once you cut them open, you tear this open, look at that. Once you see that brown tissue in here, it's not happening. You've lost the crop for that year. On grapes. Grapes, it's a little different. There's, there's opportunities in grapes. So what you want to do is go out and cut the buds. You get a razor blade, and you start to cut down through layers, the upper layer a little, just a little bit lower, and you start looking for the buds. Because with grapes, you actually have – grapes have three buds. The primary bud 
always produces the largest and best amount of fruit. The secondary bud here off to the left, the secondary bud will produce some fruit, but nowhere near the, as much as the primary bud. So if the primary bud is brown, if the secondary bud's brown, you still have a tertiary bud. And that tertiary bud is a whole lot less productive and often doesn't produce a lot of fruit at all. But it's still, well, you've got a vegetative bud down here, but you can see here on this primary one, that primary bud is dead. So you look for that brown dead tissue and that tells you whether, you're gonna get, whether you can get excited about the year or not. So this one's dead, that damaged primary, the secondary still looks all right. We're gonna have to wait and see. Um, have to go do some tests and look and see in the next two nights, see how we come out. All right. We also need to talk about the parts of a fruit tree. When we talk about a grafted fruit tree, we're talking about a scion. Scion is your favorite variety, whether that's Gala, Honeycrisp, Evercrisp, um, you name it, Jonathan, whatever. That's the desirable cult, your desirable variety. We also have a graft union. That's where the scion meets up with the rootstock. That rootstock is important, truly important, because how big is a semi-dwarf tree? All right, poll time. First question going up. You have an opportunity to select. Well, oh, there we go. So how big does a semi-dwarf tree grow in feet? Just click on the one that you think. If you want, go ahead and go ahead and give a shot at all of them, and we'll see how you do. How big does a semi-dwarf tree get? Six to eight. Just as a reminder, you actually have to answer all three and hit submit um, for your answer to be recorded. Okay. Thanks, Rick. All right. So we've got some uh, six to eight, eight to 10 feet, 12 to 15, 15 to 18. You got to give a shot to all three of them. What percent of bloom you needed to have a full crop? And then the last question, what defines a stone fruit? All right. We'll give you another 30 seconds. Fascinating. All right, I can't take it any longer. <laughs> so, okay, so the winner on the first one, almost, well, it looks like we have a tie, six to eight and eight to 10. All right, so this is fascinating because you've, you've swallowed, you've drank the Kool-Aid. Semi-dwarf apples, here's, what, here's the description thrown out there. Semi-dwarf apples are medium-sized trees, 10 to 16 feet tall. Annual pruning is needed. This tree yields hundreds of fruit. Trees start bearing in three to five years. Well, I can tell you how big is a semi-dwarf tree. A true dwarf, genetically speaking, is one-fourth the size of a standard or the species. The typical size of an apple tree just growing on its own is about 30 to 35 feet. So a true dwarf would be six to eight feet tall. Therefore, what they don't tell you 
is a semi dwarf is anywhere between six to eight feet and 30 to 35 feet. <laughs> That's a semi dwarf. That's how it's termed. But they don't want you to know that because usually when you when you hear oh semi dwarf it's a short one, people say all the time it's a semi dwarf Eric. Well, what's the rootstock? Because the key is rootstock controls tree size. Everything else is somewhat moot. These rootstocks have their designations, but the realities are we know that a seedling or a standard has no size controlling whatsoever. You'll get a tree that's 30 to 35 feet tall. So when you want, when, you, when you're talking, when somebody says, how big will it get? My first question is, what's the rootstock? I need to know rootstock. Now these were all de developed in Geneva, New York. Wonderful, wonderful fruit station there. In Geneva, New York, they come up with these, these designations so depending on size, M9, 30 to 35% of seedling, but still that's ridiculous because look, here's their own terminology, very dwarf, <laughs> M27, um, M27 after 15 years, that tree will be about six, about six feet tall. So very dwarf, dwarf, semi-dwarf, then they go into semi-vigorous and vigorous. So if you don't know rootstock, you don't know anything about how ultimately, how tall it will be. It's all based on that, based on, let's go back here. Once you talk about what size, if this is M26 or an M7, M M111, then I know how big that tree is gonna get. But if you're saying, oh, it's a semi-dwarf, you don't know how big it will get. We also have to talk about pollination. I want to I, I want to reiterate. We have self-fertile or self-infertile, self-fruitful, self-unfruitful, it, it just differential terms. Self-fertile, they do not need another cultivar for cross-pollination. Peaches, nectarines, this is true. But um, self-infertile, you actually need another cultivar for cross-pollination. If you don't have another cultivar, you're not going to get fruit. If all you have is a golden delicious apple, you're not going to get it. You need to have another, for example, crab apple. A crab apple will pollinate a, a yellow delicious gold rush. But if all you have are gold rush, they won't pollinate one another. But understand, you will always get larger, more fruit, even with self-fertile varieties, if you have a cultivar to cross-pollinate. All right, what percent of bloom is needed for a full crop? We had 40 to 45, 45 to 50, 29%, 60 to 70, 29%, 70 to 75. That's typically what we think. However, you're gonna be shocked because you only need Five to 10%. That's it. Five to 10% of bloom. Remember what I said about a plant. You need about 40 leaves to ripen one fruit. So that means they always over, overproduce. And this has consequences. How many times have you gone by somebody's little peach tree that they've tied up to the clothesline or they got a broom underneath or a shovel handle stuck under there? That's just wrong. That's telling you something's going on. In a bloom, you can have upwards of 15 blooms in a single cluster of blooms. If you look at the one in the center, this is the king. This is the king bloom, king fruit. This produces the largest and best fruit. It's the first one to open, and it will always produce the best fruit. So why do you say you got to knock off of those others? Well, let's use a quick little example. Your favorite pie, whether it's blueberry, mine, cherry, where would you sit? With your favorite pie at a table with four people or at a table with 20 people? 
Where are you going to sit? You're going to sit at the four because you want a bigger slice of pie. You only have so many, you only so much rain strikes a square foot of earth. Only so many photons from the sun strikes a square foot of earth every year. So the more you try to crowd into that, the smaller things get because they have to be divided up. If you do that and you don't, are not willing to, to thin fruit, because that's what orchardists do, you end up with what's known as a dinky fruit phenomenon. You end up with dinky fruit. Nobody likes dinky fruit. So we thin. We thin, and you can use your hand or your fist. About four inches apart, that's about how far apart you want to always thin your fruit out. So apples. I recommend that you use scab-free apples. Now, it, you can do whatever you want to do, but scab-free apples have a great advantage because one of the hardest things to control is the apple scab disease, a fungal disease. It's one of the major problems of apples, and I'll show you what it looks like. The lifespan in an orchard is about 25 years in a commercial orchard until tired homies, that's my affectionate name for home owners, homeowners, not the homies are tired, but actually until they're tired of picking or taking care of the fruit. Here's the sweet spot. The tree can tolerate six pH of six to seven, five, but the sweet spot is six, five to six, eight. That's where apples want to be. Self unfruitful, so you got to have a cultivar. Yield depends on which rootstock, and it fruits on second year wood. So, what do you do? You should be telling yourself, he said, leave it alone. Leave it alone. Don't prune it. Okay. Training systems, usually a central leader, meaning, and think of it as a triangle. Main leader, laterals coming off the side about two feet apart. Because you're trying to get it, it's all about sunlight. Sunlight getting into the middle. Pruning is key. Flowers are initiated the following one month for the following year, one month after petal fall. So if you have a gazillion apples hanging on the tree, and they don't get any bigger than uh, than a, than your cookie size, what's that going to do for your next year's bloom? you won't have a lot in the next year's bloom because all the resources are being dumped in trying to ripen that fruit. We talked about how tall is the semi-dwarf. If you don't know the rootstock, you don't know anything. So we'll look at a few of the diseases. The big one, apple scab. This is what apple scab looks like. Apple scab will knock the leaves off the tree. How many leaves do you need? Mm, yeah. So what happens if you knock them all off? You can't ripen the fruit. Here's what apple scab, not only is it on the foliage, but it's also on the fruit. The problem with the fruit is that fruit goes from that tiny flower to an apple that you can barely bite into. That takes up a lot of elasticity. Well, when you get apple scab, that skin won't stretch anymore. It becomes, instead of elastic, it becomes plastic and it will tear. So when it gets infected, that skin, that cells around it continues to expand and literally it tears open. Use genetics to fight it. These cultivars are disease resistant for apple scab, all right? Mostly there are other little things. Adams County Nursery has some other newer ones too. I, was, I, I, I wanna try some of these actually. I love Gold Rush. I love Enterprise. I want to see um, Ruby Rush. That sounds pretty good. Sooty blotch. What sooty blotch? It's these, these black spots on this apple. But the interesting thing, this is a common, um, what do we call it? A, a midsummer disease. A hot, sticky nights. This is classic disease that comes in, a fungus, but it's superficial. You can literally just wipe that off. Sooty blotch wipes off easily, as does fly speck, another one of those midsummer diseases that we use, fungicides, or you just say, I can live with it. It's my apple. I'll eat it. Okay, I'm good with that. The number one thing to try and control with apples, 
coddling moth. This dang thing, you can use pheromone confusion. Pheromone, it has the sex pheromone, chiromone for the coddling moth, female. You fill the air with that, and the male's flying around going, oh, there's the female over there. Oh, she's over there. Oh, no, she's over there. Ne they never get together. She can't lay eggs. That's a good deal. Or you use insecticide, whatever your preference. But here's what a coddling moth looks like. This is what they do. Why you don't ever want two apples hanging together is because she loves to lay eggs right between those two. You see this little frass coming out there. You open that up. The larvae, larva burrows in, eats the seeds. Seeds control how that apple expands, the shape. So once it eats those seeds, typically the apple falls off. This is kind of classic. You know, the age old joke, what's worse than a half an apple? What's it worse than an apple in an a, a worm in an apple? Finding half a worm in an apple because you already bit it. So coddling moth, this is kind of classic. If, a, if something comes off the tree, cut it open and look. That'll tell you what's going on. Another thing, San Jose scale, people think, oh, it's just bark. It's actually an insect. Here's, this is the female. This is what she looks like with this armored scale, this hard covering. If you pop that off, she's underneath those hard coverings. And the eggs, she lays eggs, crawlers crawl up, and they attach themselves to new fruit. And you get this kind of almost looks like measles. The other thing, apple maggots, you get these little stings. People say, oh, that's no big deal. You're right. But it causes these dimples. And if you think about it, what is a fruit? What's a fly? Young a larva of a fruit fly is called a maggot. The maggot's crawling through here eating. Not, not pleasant, but sometimes more than other, it's not too enjoyable. Here's another thing that most homeowners have a problem with. Plum curculio. This is a weevil. The weevil cuts this little half moon shape about eh, one or two weeks, probably two weeks after the petals fall off. Then she sticks her egg in there under that flap. She tries to put her under the flap. Luckily, that egg doesn't often stay there. And so what happens, it falls out, which is good. But here's the marks that show up. This is often what you see, these fan-shaped marks. That's from the plum curculio. What defines a stone fruit? We talked about stone fruits. Let's see, you slide down here and you got it. A fruit that has a hardened pit in its center. Yes, a fruit with a stony endocarp, a droop. You say, what the heck is a droop? Well, it's an indehiscent fruit. The outer flesh, indehiscent means it doesn't fall out. So here is a classic droop. There's the flesh. Here's the endocarp. Inside of that is the seed that surrounds this, this young embryo. So a droop, stone fruits, all the things that happen to one happen to the other. They're, it's it's kind of sequential. Peaches, plums, cherries, nectarines, mangoes. Here's a fun one. I didn't, I didn't realize this outright. Coconuts. <laughs> Coconuts are single-seeded inside out stone fruits. So the, the endocarp, the hard layers outside, the flesh is inside. That's kind of cool. I like that. So peaches, class are classic. What happens to peaches will happen to all the other stone fruits, meaning cherries, plums, uh, pretty much the demons of one or the demons of the other. Cultivars, you select. Here's the sweet spot, 6'5 to 6'8. They are self-fruitful, but you'll have better success, meaning self-fruitful mean they can pollinate themselves, but you'll, it'll do better if you have another cultivar to cross-pollinate. Depending on the rootstock, a half to four bushels per tree, they fruit on first-year wood. Wood that grew last year has the blooms for this year. Training systems, we usually use an open base. I'll show you. Pruning is key. 
one third to a half of the wood you need to take out every year because you want new wood to grow because you want new buds. It's pretty simple. In Northeast Ohio, we t- the downside is we tend to get a crop three out of 10 years, but those three years are pretty awesome to have peaches coming out of your ears. There's, there are some dwarfing rootstocks on peaches, uh, but the jury's still out as how effective they are. My Here, open vape, yes. It's 720. All right, thanks, Lee. So we pruned open vase. We open this up like an, because why? Think about it, sunlight. We want to get sunlight in there. That's pretty important. So we have this system where we actually cut out the central leader and open that up to get almost like a bowl in there to catch all the sunlight we can. So I'll show you the diseases because most of these diseases are pretty much universal throughout most of the stone fruits. Perennial canker often comes in due to a wound, whether that's pruning or damage. Here's a dead twig. You can see the canker here. Perennial canker is the killer of most of our peach trees in North, Northeast Ohio. Once this comes in, you get about two years because if you cut that bark away, here's what it's doing to the conducting tissues underneath. It's killing it. So you get two to three years and then that's it. And you pretty much have to cut the tree down. This is what one of those perennial cankers looks like when it dries down in the winter. Brown rot is the demon for peaches. This this disease you can actually see has actually moved in on the bloom and actually created a canker a sunken area made this, killed this area on the twig. This is what it looks like on the fruit. If it's touching another one, that that is just going to move from peach to peach throughout that tree. Fungicides are very effective. We have some very effective fungicides. The problem is anytime you get a cut or a wound, man, that's just an opening for this disease to come in. These are mummies. People often leave these on the tree. All these are, this is hundreds of thousands of spores. People just leave them on the tree underneath because they say that's gross. Well, that's setting yourself up for problems in the following year. This is what these, these canidia spores look like. Pretty cool. This is a micron, a micrograph of what, of, a, of the surface of one of those infected peaches. Peach scab, the very nature of scab means it's a fungal disease. It's very superficial. Not a big deal, but it can create problems if it comes in early because then the fruit can't expand quickly. We also have bacterial spot. This um, corinium bacter causes these shot hole, they call it shot hole blight because the bacteria kills the leaf tissue, leaf tissue falls out, and then you have these holes in the leaves. It's not bad if you have what later in the season, but up front, again, on that young tissue, what happens when it continues to expand? It will split open. Probably the last one I'll talk about, and then we'll go to grapes, peach leaf curl. This is what most homeowners struggle with. Peach leaf curl is a fungal disease. There's only two times to control it. Either in the fall by using a copper copper sulfate spray on the tree, just as the last of the leaves are coming off at the end of the fall or in the spring before the buds swell. Just as the buds are beginning to swell, you need to put on the copper sulfate to kill those overwintering spores. In gamosis, what's gamosis? It's nothing more than the response of the tree to a wound. Whether that's an insect pouring in or otherwise, it doesn't matter. So I want to go down and make sure we talk about grapes because Lee said you guys wanted to know about grapes. And I can do that. So what do grapes want? Well, first you have to determine what do you want? Dessert? also known as table grapes, wine grapes, very long-lived plants. You can propagate them by tip layering, putting a 
one of those running canes down under the ground, scrape the underside right where the leaves are attached, scrape that, put it down in the ground, cover it over the, with a little, keep the tip sticking up about eight inches, put that down in the ground, cover it over with, after where you wound it on the underside, put that down in the shovel hole, cover it over with the soil. By the end of the season, that plant will be growing on its own and be rooted down. Here's where you want to be, six to six, five. In parentheses are the sweet spot. This is what it can tolerate. But on either end of the sweet spot, you're going to be sacrificing something. Self-fruitful. So you don't have to have another grape, but it's always better if you do. Raise those beds up. I, I, can't, I cannot stress this enough. Raise the beds up three to four inches. I don't care if it's apples, tree fruits, any fruit you want to grow well, raise the bed up. Don't plant them in the ground. Good air drainage is important. Pruning systems, you don't need to worry about fertilizing them until you get less than six feet of new cane growth. And that's kind of rare. They fruit on first year wood, okay? That means wood that grew last year. So every year you, you can make you prune 90% out. You can make all the grapevine, grapevine wreaths, all the grapevine deer. You can make all the things you want, even your own little seats and chairs, but prune them properly. If you do, this is, the, this is our goal here. So how do you increase your grape growing potential? Don't guess, soil test. Do a soil test and find out, okay? Because once you know the pH, the nutrient deficiencies, even excesses, the nutrient capacity of your soils, they'll even give you recommendations what to do to, to get your soil back into balance. Because right here, 6.5 to 6.8, notice in that little realm here, this is where most of the nutrients are available to grapes. So we have some grape terms we have to grab, grapple with. What are table grapes? They all come from Vitus vinifera. Remember that. That's a European species that was brought over. Characterized by thin skins. Skin closely sticks to the flesh. Seeds, if they're there, slip out easily. Some varieties are seedless. And seedless grapes are easier to eat, but less flavorful. Some people say, Eric, I don't like spitting the seeds out. Well, you know, there's a lot of great flavored grapes. You might have to spit out a few seeds, and that can be fun too, because you have a contest who can spit it the furthest. But the realities are, there are a lot of wonderful, what we call dessert grapes, table grapes, thin skins, lots of flesh. Here's a, here's a chart you can uh, make sure that Lee has this. Seedless table grapes, cultivars. So here's the difference. Wine grape, much smaller. Table grape, look at the difference between skins. Because if you're making wine, you want those thick skins. And when you crush them, that creates the flavor. Table grapes, it's all about the flesh, okay? So wine grapes... Vitus vinifera, again, they're European origin. Typically, the European species are less cold tolerant. So your Pinot Grillo and all these others, they're less cold tolerant. And it'll be interesting to see what happens here these next couple of days. Labrusca, Vitus Labrusca, Vitus rotundifolia are American grapes. And then we have French-American hybrids that were crossed, the idea being, hey, Maybe we can breed in, and these French Americans have become quite popular because they tolerate some of these conditions better. All right, Labrusca is also called a fox grape, foxy musk. Think of think of Conquer grape juice. When you drink Conquer grape juice, can you taste that little vine in the back of your throat? That kind of little like green flavor. That's, that's the musk. That's the flavor that after, mm, that's the musk flavor, which is prized in, in great, in, in winemaking. It's called muscadines also. So the rotundifolia, 
is called a muscadine. First grape in this country. Think of Concord, Catawbas. American ripened in the, our varieties ripened in the fall. Fresh is only available, therefore, September, October. American varieties are also called slipskins. Remember, as a kid, you used to torture your sister or brother by shooting the grapes at him. Squeeze him, poo, slip out of there. Those are the slipskins. Separate easily, although the seeds are still in there. So can you tell the difference between wine grape and table grape? Which one's wine? Which one's table? Wine grapes here, table grapes here. So there's fact sheet, pruning backyard grapevines. Pruning is, is really critical for, for grapes. You have cane pruning where you're actually pruning most of the canes, which is the system that most people use. Or there's also a cordon or spur pruning, which most of the wineries use because it's a lot faster and easier for them. There's a myriad of, of training systems. Here's typically what happens. We string a wire between posts. We take the, we run the trunk up, take the cane and wrap it around each, of, wrap it around the wire. If you run two wires, this could be a forearm niffin. Each one of these is called an arm, forearm niffin. If you run the, the second wire and you train, canes on each one of these here's what you expect this is <laughs> this is how most people <laughs> prune their grapes they don't this isn't this this hasn't been pruned <laughs> this one is kind of started but they were a little bit timid okay what to expect well when you're out there pruning you're not going to have a guy playing the violin for you but if you understand this forearm niffin system is pretty good for homeowners. So you want a cane. First off, you go out on the end and you snap it. You're snapping it because you want to see if it's green inside. If it's green inside, it's alive. That's good. You want to select one that's about the size of a pencil. We call that those pencil. Those are a good size to keep in mind, either pinky or smaller. If it's the size of your thumb, it's too vigorous. It's a floricane. It's, it, we call them bull canes. It's too vegetative. It's not going to produce good fruit. So when we're looking at grapes, this is a, a class that I took up in at Mi well, <laughs> Michigan State. We had fun up there. It was So this guy's printing, and the, all these guys are standing around saying, yeah, looks like a grapevine to me. How about you? We've got a wire running here. One wire here, there's another wire running here. So the system they want to use is a forearm niffin. So we come in and we select a cane that grew last year. We select a cane the size of a, a, a pencil. Pencil is perfect. And at each one of these nodes, there's a bud. We count out 10 buds for the arm, the cane going this way. 10 buds for the cane attached, different cane going the other way, one cane here, one cane here for a total of about 40 buds per plant. So here he is. He selected his cane. He says, I like this one. That's the one he selected. Counts down 10 buds, cuts it. This is what it looks like. This is a beautifully pruned plant. Now, most people start to panic going from this to this. That's beautiful. That's perfectly done. You, want, you left one, a little spur here, renewal spur, hoping that this will push a cane that they can attach down here. But that's a beautifully pruned plant. If done right, you get done, you say, oh, my gosh, at least 90% of the wood comes out. You do this right. This is what they can produce. The first five buds of each cane are the most productive, the most fruitful. From the center where it's attached to the trunk, the first five are the most productive. Here's Randy, um, a, a former uh, educator who was in this area. You weigh it for, for wine grapes, you're actually weighing 
anything over a pound, of, you're trying to balance fruit and growth. So for every couple ounces, a half and a half pound over, I think it's two pounds, you actually add more buds because it was too, it grew too much and you want to make it fruit more. So they're kind of, they get a little tricky with, but that's wine grapes. You're pretty good if you go with 40 buds per plant. This is the ideal. That's a beautiful site for most people. All right, so what are the diseases? Well, black rot, downy mildew, and powdery mildew are the three, the big ones in my mind. Black rot, Guignardia bidwellii, starts out people, this is an interesting fungus because it only can produce, it can only infect grapes that are green as in unripe, that are as green as grass. Once the grapes begin to, uh, at Verizon, not, Ver not Verizon, Verizon, that's when sugars begin to come in and it colors up. At Verizon, black rot isn't a problem anymore. But before that, the unripe grapes, the green grapes, this kind of classically, you get these little spots on the leaves. These are lesions from this Guignardia. If you look at them on their hand lens, you can actually see this ring of pycnidia, like little black pimples. But here's how it happens. People are all excited. And then I get a call. Eric, I get these little black spots on my grapes. So I'm like, oh, he said, and then they shrivel up and die. You get a little black spot on the grape. Then the brown moves in. Pretty soon the entire grape is brown. And then it dries up and drops off like a raisin. That is classically black rot of grape. That you want to try and get rid of that. Typically, when someone's having a problem with black rot, it's because they're not being vigorous enough on their pruning, taking out the old canes because they can. You can have black rot on the canes also, but this is kind of classic. It just kind of. It turns brown, it gets a spot on it, goes brown, and then dries up like, shrivels up like a raisin and drops off. That's black rot. The product of choice, you have to use a fungicide. Prune right, start using a fungicide called Immunox. I-M-M-U-N-O-X. Immunox does a great job of controlling black rot or another, another fungicide called Pristine. Both of those do an excellent job. Captan, Thyram, those fungicides will not touch, won't touch black rot of grape, Guignardia. The other one is a, is a foliar disease called downy mildew. In downy mildew, you get these lesions. In these lesions, you have a, an infected area right next to one that's as green as grass. So you get kind of almost like a little checkerboard kind of approach on this downy mildew. And downy, if unchecked, remember what I said about foliage on grapes. If you knock, if you, because this is a, not only is it foliar, but it'll move into the fruit. And once it moves in, you're not getting it out. It is, downy mildew is one of the more difficult diseases to control on grapes. Sanitation is key, but a good spray program, here's where it starts out. It's on the underside, on the, black, on the back side, you get a, a, almost a, a downy, a blackish type of sporulation. And this can really rip through a vineyard in a matter of a week. If it's left unchecked, it moves not only into the flowers, into the clusters, it kills the clusters, but then infects the fruit on the vine and it's unsaleable. Moves right in where you're starting there where the, it was getting ready to continue to grow. But, but since you suddenly start losing your leaves, you're now losing growth, which means you're affecting next year's planting also, or next year's crop. The last one is downy, or sorry, powdery mildew. 
powdery mildew looks like somebody took a little talc powder and sprinkled it on the leaf. You get these colonies, these little circular colonies of fungus. Even though it's not a not devastating in the context of like downy mildew, powdery mildew shuts down the photosynthetic capacity of the leaf. It just shades it out. And remember what I said, it takes a lot of energy to ripen fruit, always. It'll also move into the clusters, infect the clusters. Once that happens, game over. What are you going to do with that? Well, you're, then you just have to say, okay, time to think about next year, what we can do to try to control it. And ultimately, remember, time flies like an arrow, fruit flies like a banana. All right. Questions for me. Thanks, Eric. So if anybody has a question, please use the chat box. Or if you want to, feel free to unmute yourself and ask a question. And Eric, I do have to say that you're being a little humble about your dad's uh, involvement in the uh, blueberry <laughs> breeding program. Um, there is a variety out there named after your dad. Yeah, he it's Draper. And it was named after my dad. My dad was uh, most of the, actually most of the blueberry cultivars in currently being sold, most of them were developed by my dad. So it, it, was, it was great growing up. Great growing up. I always had <laughs> walking the fields eating fruit. There's nothing better than that. Questions for me? Um, and just as a reminder, if you are seeing, um, well, if we get some frost tonight and tomorrow night, you may not see the damage until two to four days after yeah. the frost event. It really depends on the temperature after that frost event for how fast that will show up. So if you go out there tomorrow morning and you start cutting open your flowers, they're going to be as green as day because they've been in the refrigerator. So you need right. to, to, to warm up a little bit. Good point, Lee. Yeah, you just wait and see. Don't, don't just look at those petals and say, ah, we're good to go. Let it go four or five days and then start cutting buds and look. Yeah. And even though the, the carpal is the most important point for fruit development, I do know that losing uh, the petals will reduce your pollination. So you, but it's mother nature just thinning for you as long as it doesn't get too cool. <laughs> the, the dang pollinators don't know where to go. Either. No, there's no target zone. <laughs> right. <clears throat> yeah, I, I, as Eric mentioned, I did a lot of work on cold hardiness, blueberries, and I killed on purpose a lot of blueberry flower buds using <laughs> uh, a sub-zero uh, freezer. So. so you ought to talk to him about it. It's pretty cool what, what, what he found out. It's pretty amazing how plants respond. Any questions for Eric? This was great. Um, black rot. Anytime I get a phone call, I'm like, oh, yeah, it's turning up like raisins. It's black rot. It's black rot. Uh, you know, I'll, I get a little black spot on it, and then it turns brown and it shrivels up like a raisin. Black rot. Which means you prune better. Number one, prune correctly. Number two, you're going to have to use a fungicide. Immunox is the one available to homeowners that does an excellent job. And you have to start spraying that after at shuck fault. I don't know if you've ever noticed that. <laughs> if you've ever looked at, at grape, <laughs> grape flowers or like they look like little windmills down there. There's not a lot of not a lot of stuff there, little petals, but those are called shucks. And when those fall off, that's when you begin your spray program. And then once it starts, to, your grapes begin to color up. You can back off but that time when it's when they're unripe when they're green as grass and unripe that's time for guignardia that's black rot time everybody gets excited because they see all those clusters hanging out there 
they're so excited. And then all of a sudden, little speckle, 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 speckle. <laughs> and it's off and going. Yeah. And unfortunately, Concord, which everybody loves, is one of the most susceptible varieties. Uh huh. All right. Well, if there are no All questions, right. I will turn it back over to Cassandra. Thank you so much. Um, I don't have anything else to add, but I did want to pass it over to Amy for our closing remarks tonight to see if she had anything to add um, and to, you know, wrap it up for this evening if there's no other questions. Hi everyone, this is Amy from Trumbull Soil and Water. So I was a few minutes late. Today was our bulb and tree sale pickup. And so if anyone is interested, we don't have any fruit trees right now, but we do have some Norway spruce. Um, and I believe one pack of silky dogwood left and maybe one pack of speckled alder which are great for nitrogen fixing and do well in full sun, part sun, moist and well-drained soils. But this has been a great series. I wanna thank all of our guest speakers, but tonight, uh, Mr. Draper for joining us and giving us a lot of good information uh, for grapes in particular and some of our other backyard fruits. And um, if anyone has anything that they'd like to see us do in the future, uh, please let Cassandra Lee and I know, because I think there's talk about continuing this series um, maybe at a later point this year or uh, into 2022. So without further ado, I'll turn it back over to Cassandra. One more chance for questions. I'll make Ready? sure that Lee has oh. all the, um, the, the URLs and everything of the resources for everyone. Thanks, Eric. And we will be sending out uh, all those free publications. We're going to put all, stick them all in the USB drive that we're going to send out at the end. So thank you. Okay. All right. Well, thank oh. you, everybody. Have a great night. And we'll see you next week for our very last session. All right. Have a wonderful evening. Bye. Bye.